good morning and welcome back to the basement. So moving on in our series about building a steampunk lamp. The actual lamp fixture. So I have a couple choices. I bought this fixture at the Habitat for Humanity store. It's a, a reproduction of a sign light. The idea is that it's on a, a hoop arm and then it shines down on a sign on a billboard at about a 45 degree angle. It could work in this setting if I would run the articulated arm up at exactly 45 degrees and then bring a 90 off that and then this could sit there and point down. And that could work. And if all else fails, I'll go that direction. Having said that, I have carried home several of these safety lights, vapor proof or whatever you want to call them. And I like the idea of this light, in particular, with a shade directing it downward. I, I like that concept. The problem is that this particular light doesn't really seem made to be hanging from a cord. I think I could make it work, but I'm not sure it's going to look great. So thinking about that and looking at that, I had the idea, I have a couple of these glass dome globes, and I have this big lamp fixture that came from Goodwill for $1.51, this big shade. So my idea was, what if we combined the glass dome with the shade, and then I need an industrial looking upper housing. And for that, we have this vacuum actuator from the air conditioning system in a big building. I dug this out of the dumpster a year or so ago. And it has these nice magnesium, pot metal, it's not aluminum, whatever it is, it has these nice industrial looking housings. So at this moment, I'm thinking about doing something like that with that on there. My only hesitation at all is whether it's just too big in scale. But I think what I'd like to do is proceed with putting it together and then see how it looks. So that's what we're going to work on today. Hope you enjoy. And even if I don't end up using this fixture, perhaps I'll publish it as part of the series because it's all part of the fun, the enjoyment, the creativity of how something like this comes together. So to begin the little, little experiment, I've taken tin snips and I've cut out the flange that was in here. It was too big to go up into here. This was too much of a pain to try to mount up in the lathe and I cut a groove out of it using a carbide burr and a die grinder but I still couldn't get it to pop in there and I realized it needed to be flatter anyway. So I just cut the flange out of there. And now that sits on there like that. And the truth is, I like that. I think the thing to do is to use the larger of the glass globes Clean this up some. It doesn't need to look amazing, but it shouldn't look that disgusting. And get the electrical details in there. And finally, I need a way to attach this globe. I think I may try to do a brass manifold inside there that holds a couple bulbs and then has a place to attach the globe. The trick there is whether or not I can put a hole in this without destroying it. I think the first thing to do is to try cutting the hole in the globe. So I'm going to be trying to drill, drill through here using this diamond tipped core drill. They're dirt cheap on eBay. The trick with them, drilling especially thin glass like this, uh, number one you have to understand this may not work. It may not be possible. It may shatter because the glass may be under some stress from its manufacturing process. And there's no way to know until we know. Number two, the trick is plenty of lubrication and lots of patience. Very little pressure. Just barely letting the pressure of the drill rest on the glass. All right, there it is. All right, so here's my plan. 
I have this fixture that I paid a dollar for that holds two small bulbs. I'm going to build a something reminiscent of a gas lamp where there is a manifold down inside the chamber that is supported by brass tubing and I will have the brass tubing come over and capture the bottom of the glass globe and then have a T coming off coming over to support the actual light bulbs. The one problem is that this thing is fairly long and it's going to put one light bulb way at the very bottom and one up out of sight. So I'm going to take this apart and see if I can't shorten it up. I'm going to try removing these these intermediate fixtures and see if I can draw this thing together and make it perhaps an inch shorter than it currently is to kind of get these bulbs to be a little bit more visible. If I just shorten it straight up to a brass T like that, then I think it's short enough. So I'm going to look at that. I'm going to try one other option with a couple of 90s and uh, we'll see how that seems to work. Now I've found a solution that I like. I need a couple of brass close 90s or uh, close nipples to join these L's to this T and then those two fixtures can both point straight down and I think that they will be close enough together you know not too close together not too far apart it's about just the right distance for a small bulb to hang in this fixture so I'll, I will do the brass uh, manifold like I was talking about and then mount this thing at about this height so that the bulbs are halfway up the glass dome all right, so there it is after a whole lot of messing and finickiness. And I have that going the wrong way, so i got to spin it around. This has to be facing up because I want the bulbs to be in an upward orientation, I think. Well, I'll decide. Okay, so I have this brass uh, threaded shaft mounted up the three jaw. This is a miscellaneous plumbing piece for connecting a sink to the supply. So I just finished knurling this edge and I'm going to take a little cut here and then a little cut there to cut the thing off. And what I'm making is a little threaded ring to hold the glass globe up into place. For the looks of it to look like a factory made part. So there's our little locking ring. I'll leave this actually sticking out the bottom a little bit. The glass will slide up over this shaft and then the ring will just secure the glass in place. So what I'll do is I will put a bend in here that I think is about right for what I need for down in that tube. And then I will cut it to length. It's going to be hard to choose the length in advance. So here's where things are at right now. Took a piece of tubing, bent it to the same general profile as the inner rim of the glass drilled through the brass nipple and then soldered it in using regular plumbing solder so that will go through there and then this ring will screw on and the glass will be captured. So this will be cut somewhere near this mark but I'm going to wait until I get the bulbs. The bulbs should be here tomorrow. Make sure that it's gonna work with the bulbs installed.
round shape with three tabs. So I have this now cut out to fit tight inside the profile. And then I will attach it with three brass headed screws around the perimeter, equally distant. So the manifold of the, the brass manifold that the lights are attached to will be attached to here, securely to this. This plate is heavy enough to kind of support that torque. And then the dome will draw tight up against that, which is locating the dome and locking it in place. And then all the wiring, it's creating an enclosure up inside this dead space. And that's where I can join the wiring. Here it is kind of mocked up. I'm preparing to make the final cuts and threadings to finish up this part of the of the fixture. What I'm trying to decide is where to locate this manifold that the lights will screw into, which is to say the vertical height of it up in here, a distance away from this plate, or do I want it up at its highest possible point? I think in a perfect world, to be closest to reality to a real one then the center of the filaments of the bulbs should be near the center of this dome and it looks like if I mount it right where it's at I'm gonna be pretty close to that so there's no easy way to film the actual doing of it but I installed a little this is a standard lamp making all thread nipple just you know screwed that into the brass T pushed it through the plate, and then cinch it up tight with a nut. There we go. So next I will shorten up these brass threads a little bit to accommodate the final length of that uh, ring there. So here I'm using acetone, aka nail polish remover, to remove this hand painted detail that's on this old shade. Some kind of a gold detail that they painted on here. I'm going to be painting this to look like it's been enameled and as such any kind of visible pattern underneath my coat of paint is going to ruin that illusion. So if I had to, I would hit this whole thing with paint remover and get it all down to bare aluminum, whatever it takes to get it down to a physically flat surface. Even though I can still see these areas, the areas are just shiny spots. They're no longer something you can feel. So I think that's going to look fine. Pull behind. The holes are all drilled. The old pattern's been cleaned off, it's all clean. Filled this area with tape so that I don't get overspray onto the inner white bonnet that I hope to basically preserve intact. So it's ready to paint. got a nice generous coat of the green on there. I'm going to try to dust it with the blue to try to give the the sense that it was done in two colors. The blue laid down first and the green second. Or whatever it is that makes enamelware look like it does. Just 
I'm trying to give it just hints. Just the faintest hint. Of the speckle. And then we will lay on a nice generous coat of the clear that will hopefully give it a glazed look. I'll give that a few minutes to dry and I'll hit it with another fairly substantial coat of the clear. All right, so I just finished putting the fourth coat of clear on it. I'm trying to get something on there that's so thick that it looks like a glazing. <clears throat> Problem is I'm also beginning to get some visible runs. You can see a visible run down in there. So I'm going to stop here. I think it, it's still going to turn out okay. I don't think it's been ruined. I think I essentially got the look I was going for. As far as the housing goes, I took the housing to this wire wheel and kind of burnished the whole thing. I'm not trying to make it look new. I'm trying to make it look like something that's old that's been cleaned up. Now I'm trying to make a decision about how to suspend or attach the housing to the pipe, to what will be the uppermost pipe. And to give it some thought, I have this chain I got at a estate sale from a clockmaker, so this is probably weight chain from a grandfather clock kind of a thing. But that uh, it just looks too diminutive to me. It just doesn't look beefy enough. This housing has this nice, these nice lugs with the holes in them, and it happens that this pipe, this brass tubing, fits these lugs. So that seems like kind of a slam dunk there. Then the, uh, but the, the question remains how to bring it on up. So I think the direction I'm going to go is I have this brass pipe that I bought in an antique store. I think I paid $12 for it. But it is a six and a half foot length of a fairly heavy walled brass pipe that is the same OD as three quarter inch water pipe. So I can actually thread it, you know, I actually treat it like pipe just made of brass. So I think what I'm going to do is we're going to take off a length of this pipe. We're going to carefully drill it for the ID of this tubing here. And we're going to make a either fixed or swivel fitting for this housing to rotate around. And then from there, we'll probably thread this end to screw into the fitting at the end of the swing arm. I'm going to use this, I'm going to install this as a fitting on here so that it has a more of a finished look of an intentional fitting on this joint around which to rotate. So I'm going to turn this down 30 or 40 thousandths and then bore this out 40 or 50 thousandths, whatever it takes for them to fit together. So rather than heat it all up and get solder everywhere, I'm going to use Loctite 680 to join these. For a nice tight joint, Loctite 680 is every bit as strong as solder. Uh, in fact, I once did a full install of a safety brass rail in a, in a public facility, and they actually spec'd Loctite 680 as the joining material. It was, you know, pre-lacquered, pre-finished, so, you know, you didn't want to heat it all up. And they spec'd Loctite 680, and as far as I know, it's still there to this day. It has to be scrupulously clean, and the fit should be, give or take, a thousandth of an inch.
when I bore the through hole that it's going to pivot on, it will actually be through both the fitting and the pipe. So there's not a strength issue there at all. This will be perfectly strong. It's never going to come off there unless you heat it up to 450 degrees or whatever the point is of Loctite melting. And by the way, that's the way. Uh, a lot of times you use something like a Loctite 680 to actually fixture apart, to join something together, machine it, and then when you're done, you can just heat it back up to the 400 or 500 degrees, whatever it is. The Loctite lets go, you take the part back apart, and there you go. Kind of like in the old days when they were doing clock making, they would use a heavy wax or a, or a pitch you know, to hold a piece while they were working on it. You can do the same thing with Loctite. So there's that. We'll give that a few minutes to dry, and then we will bore it to the size of this shaft. Moving on, I need a way to capture this shaft inside of these lugs. I thought about doing a set screw. I think from a decorative standpoint that I'm going to attach these finials. These are off of a, of a stair rod for keeping a carpet runner in place on stairs. You know, these are the rod that you would tuck into the corner to make the carpet hold still. There again, kind of Victorian. I think I'm going to install these finials on here. It's a little bit uh, edgy as far as being too decorative, but I think the thing needs, I think it needs a little dressing up. Actually, what I may do, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use these, but I'm gonna turn off the very top finial so that they're not quite so uh, gaudy decorative. We'll remove everything from this point up, and that will be a little more. A little more muted. I think that'll be great. So this is how the caps will be joined. They're kind of press fit onto here. There will be a screw through here, partly to join them and partly to just look correct since this hole appeared when I cut the knob off. So that'll be there. This one will kind of press fit on over here and screw go in. So this was a real tight fit. I had to kind of put it in the vise and squeeze it over there, which is a good thing. So then we'll put this in here. And then this. I don't know if we can thread it on or if we'll have to squeeze it in the vise a little bit. Maybe we'll just thread it with a couple pairs of channel locks, rotate it and see if it'll tighten up of its own volition. want it to be up tight to that shaft so that you can't see a gap like so there it is this will be hanging from the swing arm we'll drill this out to allow the wire to pass through we'll use this as kind of the, the bushing for the wire to pass through and then all we have to do is connect it all to the swing arm
there. And then here's the view up inside. There again, I'm not trying to fool anyone, but I don't want to blow the illusion either. I want it to be possible to believe that this thing is old and industrial. So when I was a kid, when I was in high school, I was at school one day and I got a call from a family member, I forget who, who told me the house is on fire. So I rushed home to find that the basement of our house had completely burned out. It had scorched and charred all of the basement area. We had living area down there. And it had uh, burned out the entire room containing the furnace. And the cause of the fire was electrical. And the cause of the fire was something that my dad had done not realizing the fire hazard that it represented. My dad had set up in an open junction box there were a couple wires sticking out and he had connected them just by allowing the tension of the wires to lean against each other because the wires have some springiness and you can just get them to lean against each other and if they touch at all then it will make an electrical connection and it will work. And as far as he knew, that was fine because it was just a temporary connection. And he didn't have a wire nut handy. Well, what we found out after the fire was that due to the nature of the electric current, changing direction 60 times per second, forward, back, forward, back, forward, back. And what happens with these wires, if you just have a connection like this, is it sets up a harmonic and the wires start moving microscopically and it increases and increases and increases and then you can imagine what happens if I were to rub this back and forth together rapidly for a long time which is it causes friction and that spot will tend to melt then once it has melted away because it's doing it at this incredibly precise way it melts away just enough to form a perfect arc across there. Now 120 volts, it's not easy to get an arc. But if you'll hold it perfectly steady at the perfect distance, it will arc. And as this wears away, it creates that perfect air gap for the arc to happen. And of course the arc is however many thousand degrees you can melt steel with it, right? That's what arc welding is. And it causes a fire. So one of the things that I took away from that, I actually got to help the electrician who reinstalled our circuit breaker and all the wiring and who uh, explained this to me, how important it is to have wires bonded, physically tied together in a way that cannot wiggle and move so that you don't get that harmonic set up so that you don't have a fire. So I have tied a little square knot here in this cord which will act as a stop so that I can pull the cord out but only up to a certain point. I have a mark in here. There it is. So what I can do is look through here hopefully. I'm looking down through this hole to, to find when I'm aligned and then I will drop in a screw. Once I have one screw started that will kind of be my, my ace in the hole. Okay, so there's the view from there. And then we put our filthy glass dome on. So it's captured and it's under some spring pressure to hold the glass tightly, but it's not under so much pressure that it's gonna cause it to shatter. And that, that is that. There is the actual light fixture for the steampunk lamp. Final episode, we put it all together and make it work. And hey, thanks for watching.